Well, if you have your Bible, I encourage you to turn to John chapter 14, verse 27. John chapter 14, I'll read verse 27, and these these are the words of Jesus. So brothers and sisters, this is God's holy and inerrant word. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Thus far to read God's word. Well, it has been said that the 20th century is perhaps the most bloodiest century ever. Uh, you had World War I and World War II. You had the Cold War, the Vietnam War. And even now to this day, there are wars still happening. In the previous 3,500 years, historians calculated that the world had seen less than 300 years of peace. In the last five and a half millennia, more than 8,000 peace treaties have been broken, and more than 14,000 wars fought with a combined total of about 4 billion casualties. And there was a group that studied and researched this topic on world peace or global peace. Uh, This was known as the Global Peace Index. And they said that the world is less peaceful today than at any time in the last decade. And and my guess as to why that's the case is because we're just coming out of the worldwide pandemic. And certainly during the last two or three years, the majority of the globe in the globe has experienced so much anxiety Uh, despair, uh, uncertainty, uh, fear, uh, political discourse and disagreements, uh, financial loss, familial loss, uh, loss of opportunities, and loss of time. Certainly, we are reminded just how fallen and sinful this world is, and that this world is marked by chaos. And in some shape or form, we face distress at a personal level, public level, a global level. And the words of Job, the book in the book of Job, ring true until this day. Job 14 verses 1 to 2 says, man who is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. He comes out like a flower and withers. He flees like a shadow and continues not. So I'm wondering, this, as I'm speaking, I wonder for you this morning, are you experiencing turmoil and trouble this morning? Do you find yourself st- stuck in an endless loop of angst or feeling of anxiety, worriness? Is something bothering you this morning, even as you come into the church to worship? See, there has always been the pursuit from the world to attain peace. But perfect peace is impossible to achieve at all levels. See, at least in the human level. The only time in the history of humanity that there was ever perfect peace was in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve lived. And this was before the fall. And after sin entered into humanity, after sin entered into the world, that perfect peace was gone. Sin manifests itself through violence and selfishness, corruption, exploitation, extortion, murder, falsehood, deception, and so much more. And through the manifestation of sin, lack of peace fills the mood of the world and disrupts our soul and our, our, our inner life. Now, that's not to say that we cannot experience peace to a certain degree, but it does come and go, sometimes even unexpectedly. For example, you, you decrease your stress by going on a vacation from work. And you get away from the city, you get away from the f- f- familiarity, and uh, get away from your normal routine. Uh, and then you go and enjoy the beauty of creation. 
See, the one moment you're enjoying a peaceful environment, maybe with your family and friends, and the next moment, while you're on vacation, you get a phone call or a text message that your someone you love so dearly ended up in the hospital. That peace just disappeared. God had a plan. God had a plan to restore peace on earth. And on the second Sunday of Advent, we are reminded once again that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to bring peace as the Prince of Peace. When Christ was born, the angel said to the shepherd, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And even as I'm saying this, one of the, here's one of the biggest objections to Christianity by the skeptics. Well, if God is indeed good, and that he promised peace on earth, if Jesus came as the Prince of Peace, then why is there still evil? Why is there still evil in the world? Why are there, still, why are there wars in the world? Why is there corruption in this world? If this is the God you worship. Well, that question is a legitimate question. Is a legitimate objection to the claims of Christianity. And of course, it is beyond the scope of, the ser- of this morning's sermon, and we could dive into that in the future, talking about how to respond to that using apologetics. But in my response is that you would need to understand what exactly the Bible teaches about peace. Because so often, what God says about peace, we have a different understanding of peace. And knowing what the Bible teaches will clear up misunderstanding of God's plan in restoring peace. And so what does the Bible say about peace? Well, peace is a very precious word for the Jews. Uh, this, uh, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. Shalom. And in the Jewish culture, shalom is a customary Jewish greeting and words of farewell. It was a way to wish someone a good health uh, and prosperity. And in, order, in other words, you wish someone to be whole. And scripture's teaching on shalom is quite comprehensive and can mean many things in different contexts. But the word peace has an interesting biblical definition. It means to, uh, to, it means being whole, being intact, or being complete. It is the opposite of brokenness or damaged. It speaks of having a perfect shape of a brick without a crack. And it also speaks about building, a building, and being intact, being complete. That is shalom. And so in our lives, there are so many moving parts. You can look at them as bricks. You can say just as our work, our school, our relationship, maybe even cooking a meal, and et cetera. And we try our best, very best, to keep those parts maintained to end together and complete. And if any times those parts ever break or get fractured, then we lose a sense of peace. Now, many may understand peace as the absence of war and and promotion of social harmony in a society where there's no crime and violence. And moreover, pretty much everyone would commonly use the phrase, rest in peace, when we talk about someone's death and hope that they're in a better place. And our society also talks about peace as experiencing human tranquility. And certainly, those concepts are included in the biblical meaning of peace when used in the right context. But peace is more of a theological issue than a social issue. It's it's more of a theological issue than a social issue. And we'll learn more about what I mean by that as I expound this text this morning. You see, our text this, this morning comes from our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives a rather, profound, a rather profound statement that contains a key promise given to his people, which is peace. And the context of this verse is found in the middle of this section of John's gospel called the Upper Room Discourse. And the discourse was Jesus' final instruction and teaching to his disciples on the night before his crucifixion. And Jesus celebrated his, the Passover, also known as the Last Supper, And Jesus washed his disciples' feet in John 13. And the overview of the upper room discourse is that Jesus was going to explain to them that he's leaving them. He's leaving his disciples. 
And the disciples, as you've read this, if you have read the story, the disciples never understood. They didn't understand what was going on. Uh, they didn't understand what Jesus meant, and they were struggling with the idea that he's going to be crucified and betrayed since he's the Messiah. And they were greatly troubled. But Jesus comforts them. He encourages them. He will not leave them entirely. And he promised that the Father will send the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, in his name. Uh, the Holy Spirit will teach them all things and help them remember the, the teachings of Christ. And that was in verse 26. And after introducing the Holy Spirit in verse 26, Jesus draws our attention to the key word, our key topic in our verse, which is peace. And now while this verse does not directly connect with the narrative of the birth of Jesus, we can still draw the implications of the Christmas story, can we? See, Jesus wasn't just the Prince of Peace when he's a baby. He's still that peace that we urgently need till this day. And so, with that said, there are three important lessons that Jesus wants to teach you from this verse. And that is first, you need the heavenly peace of Christ. See, notice that Jesus says this, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Notice that Jesus begins with a sentence with peace. Uh, see, in the Greek, uh, in the Greek, the word peace is placed at the beginning of the sentence. You know, he could have just said, I leave peace with you, or he could have said, I give my peace to you. No, but the word begins, the word peace begins at the beginning of the sentence. And this is actually Jesus' emphasis to you, peace to you. You need that peace. Now, it seems like Jesus is speaking rather poetically here. And in, in these two lines seem synonymous in general, but I think we can understand the depth of this peace that Jesus is offering to you this morning. First, this peace belongs to Jesus and is grounded in Jesus. See, where does this peace come from that Jesus is offering you? It comes from himself. It comes from the Lord himself. He's the one who possesses peace, true peace. Again, he's the Prince of Peace, according to Isaiah. In Colossians 3.15, it says that, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. In Hebrews 13, verse 20, it says that Christ is the God of peace. He is the source of all true peace. He's the source of all authentic peace. That's why Jesus says, my peace I give to you. And what's important to note is that Jesus said this on the night before his arrest. In the face of trial, in the face of tribulation, our Lord was that perfect peace. This peace allowed him to remain composed in the face of ridicule, disdain, enmity, hatred, betrayal, and death. That's why Peter says when, in 1 Peter 2, 23, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. See, knowing that Christ experienced peace in the face of hardship, and it is the same peace that he gives to you if you are a follower of Jesus. Second thing we need to learn is that to truly experience this peace that Jesus is offering to you and gives to you, you must understand fundamentally that peace has to do with the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ and the nature of salvation. See, our Lord Jesus was at perfect peace because he had a perfect relationship with his Father. But we do not. Scripture teaches us that the most important thing about peace is that we need peace with our holy God. See, due to the fall of Adam and Eve, humanity has been in cosmic warfare against God. We have sinned against him. We have fallen short of the glory of God. And God's word describes sinners like, like us, like myself and you, and the system of this world being in enmity with God. And therefore, God will judge sinners with perfect justice and righteousness. But the good news, especially the good news of, of Christmas, is that Jesus came into the world. He came into the world to die and to pay the penalty of our sins, and that those who turn away from their sins 
and trust in Christ for salvation can be saved. And those who place their faith in Jesus Christ, and what he has done on the cross was to reconcile us to a relationship with God and thus having peace with God. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, But he, that's Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, shalom, and with his wounds we are healed. Romans 5 1 says, Therefore, we have, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what you need to understand about peace, is that if you don't have a relationship with God, you do not have peace with Him. Because that's the most important thing. But, but the most important thing you need to know about peace is, is to have a relationship with God. And so that's the second thing. And the third thing we need to learn about this peace is that it's connected to the Holy Spirit. It's connected to the Holy Spirit. You see, those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, not only will you have peace with God the Father, but you will also receive the Holy Spirit. You see, in the previous verse, Jesus says, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. You see, this makes sense because peace is one of the characteristics of the of, the, of Christian living. And if you, have res- if you have believed in Christ, you will have the Holy Spirit living in you, dwelling in you. And peace is one of the fruit the whole, of the, the, one of the fruit of the Spirit. And fourth, this peace that we need to understand that Jesus is giving to us is a free gift from him. It's a free gift from him. There is no financial payment on your part. Our Lord God freely gives this gift of peace to you if you're willing to receive him by faith. See, Isaiah 55 says this, verses 1 to 2, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Now, while Isaiah doesn't use the word peace here, it communicates one important idea, our desperateness. It communicates to our desperateness. So let me repeat the question that I asked at the beginning. Are you experiencing turmoil and trouble this morning? Do you find yourself stuck in an endless loop of angst Are you feeling anxious this morning? Are you feeling worried this morning? Are you feeling depressed this morning? And if that is you, God invites you to come to him for true and heavenly peace. However, despite the fact that Jesus offers us his peace and and he does offers us his peace, something or someone else is trying to compete with Jesus in the offer. And that's that's the second thing we need to understand, is that the world will offer you a counterfeit peace. See, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. So another translation would say, and the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. See, Jesus is providing a contrast between the peace he gives and the peace that the world gives. But what what is this world that Jesus is referring to? You see, in the Gospel of John, this word, this word world is a huge theme. And it's a word that can mean probably 10 different things, depending on the context. But what I think it could mean is that Jesus is talking about the system of this evil age that is hostile to God. It is a world that is lost in sin. It is totally at odds with anything that is related to God and his word. It is the world that is ruined and depraved. And yet this world attempts to offer a solution to, for you to attain peace. It could be in a form of escapism, self-indulgence, materialism, greed, romance, substance abuse, politicians making promises to legislate a new law, uh, false religion, and on and on it goes. But the world's supposed solution avoids the true problem of our hearts. It avoids the true problem, and that is sin, 
and our need for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, the world cannot offer you peace. It is powerless to do so because it is always chaotic. It is always chaotic. It is always ruined. I mean, have you not read the news lately? So if you just turn on the news, you see a lot of bad news almost all the time. And D.A. Carson said this about the world, and I quote, There is sufficient hatred, selfishness, bitterness, malice, anxiety, and fear that, attempt, that every attempt at peace is rapidly swamped within a biblical framework, attempts to achieve personal, uh, mental, or emotional stability, or merely political stability, whether by ritual, mysticism, or propaganda, without dealing the, with the fundamental reasons for strife, are intrinsically loathsome, end quote. You see, the world that we are living in is like the modern prophets, the modern false prophets and priests of the Old Testament. See, God condemned them for attempting to patch serious wounds of Israel by giving them superficial words. See, Jeremiah chapter 6, verses 13 to 13, 15 says this, For from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. And from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. And the truth is that God says in Isaiah that there is no peace for the wicked. And the Apostle Paul even warned Christians that the world will try to convince you with this message of peace before Jesus' return, before Jesus' return. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. See, when Christ comes, for the second time, his second advent, there will be no true peace and security for the wicked that has rejected Jesus and the message of salvation. And those who buy into the world's offer of peace will be greatly disappointed because it is a counterfeit peace. It is a pseudo peace that can never truly satisfy our deepest longing of our hearts for true and biblical peace. See, Augustine has said this. Augustine said this like a long time ago. He, he, he lived in the 4th century B, uh, AD. And this still rings true to this day. He said, our heart is restless until it rests in you, which is God himself. And if you continue to pursue peace in this world, you will find yourself continuously being restless over and over again seeking for something else to satisfy your longing for peace. But the peace that Jesus offers you and gives to you is different from the world. Only those who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior can have true peace with God. And when you are at peace with God through Jesus, you should be able to experience the peace of God in your Christian life as you grow deeper in your relationship with him. However, admittedly, that's not always easy because we face difficult situations where we do not always have God's peace in our hearts, even as believers. Even as a pastor myself, if I can admit. And Jesus provides the final instruction in this verse. And that is, you are to engage in the daily battle for God's peace. He says, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And Jesus spoke to this, this, these same words, almost the same words, back in John chapter 14, verse 1. 
He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And it seems that even the disciples, maybe including you this morning, you need that reminder. See, after promising to give them the Give, uh, prom- promising to give them peace through the Holy Spirit, he commands his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. See, the battle, the battle for God's peace begins at the heart level. Notice that Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. See, Jesus wasn't speaking to their literal heart, the, anat- the human anatomy, as if there's something medically wrong with it. Uh, Jesus was speaking to their personhood, their whole being. It includes all aspects like their intellect, their thinking, uh, their motivation, their emotions, their desires, and their affections. Now, why does Jesus speak about their hearts? Well, in this context, Jesus has been telling his apostles, his disciples, that he's about to go to his, his father. In the eyes of the apostles, Jesus leaving them made them feel troubled in their hearts. To them, it was confusing. It was unsettling. It bothered them from the depth of their hearts, their whole being. Jesus understands their heart fully well. He even said this later on in John chapter 16, verse 6, that sorrow has filled your heart. What, is, what are you going through this, these days? What has caused sorrow in your heart lately? Know that Jesus understands that and knows that. Because their hearts, the disciples' hearts, were not much different from our hearts. Our, heart is also, our hearts are flawed with imperfection. They're rather hard to control like our emotions, our impulses. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? However, God promised that the Holy Spirit, when you believe in Christ and you have received Him, the Holy Spirit lives in you, He promised that He will renew you. The Holy Spirit will bring a renewal of the heart because His Spirit resides in you to bear good fruit for his glory. And we as Christians, we need to humbly confess to the Lord and ask him to create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us because we know we are fallen. We know we sin. We know we're not perfect. We know we, are, we, can, we, we, know we are easily succumb, can easily succumb to fear and anxiety and fall into our fleshliness. But God is gracious. He invites you to come to him in prayer about your circumstances. The Apostle Paul tells us something very powerful here in Philippians chapter 4. He says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. As As a result, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See, when we, when we understand that the battle begins at the heart level, we shift our focus to the battle for obedience. See, what Jesus is saying here is rather hard to swallow and hard to obey, especially if you're genuinely troubled and afraid this morning. But it is a commandment for our Lord Jesus Christ. And we, are, we as Christians are to learn to appropriate Jesus' promise of peace to ourselves. A pastor once said that uh, to live in anguish over the past, anxiety concerning the present, and a- or apprehension about the future is to fail to appropriate that peace. Jesus spoke in something similar to his disciples when they were on the boat in the middle of a great storm. They were terrified, but Jesus was perfectly uh, calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? You see, it is a daily battle for obedience, isn't it? You may struggle with obedience to the Lord because of your sinful nature. You may disobey the Lord without even knowing it, or maybe because you acted out on your emotions or your own intuition. Or maybe you do not want to obey. 
because of your stubborn pride. You choose not to obey. And I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't feel moments of sadness. I'm not saying we shouldn't feel moments of sadness such as like the loss of a loved one. That can trouble us. I'm not saying we shouldn't have genuine concerns for someone, like your children uh, acting out and being wayward. I'm not saying we, can, we shouldn't be naturally afraid about something, like heights or spiders, that's you. Uh, but I'm not saying we should suppress them. But what I am saying is that it may become a spiritual issue when those circumstances replace your trust in the Lord and you start depending on yourself or anything apart from God. So it is a daily battle for obedience. And if you are going through those things, God invites you to come and bring them to him. Bring your troubles to him. Bring your turmoils to him. God is not afraid to receive them and hear your prayers. But you, but you must take heed of what Jesus says. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And if you love the Lord, you will obey him. And it will be a battle for obedience to enjoy his peace. And so to summarize, Jesus teaches you three important lessons. You need the heavenly peace of Christ. The world will offer you a counterfeit peace. You are to engage in a daily battle for God's peace. And just by way of application, let me just try to share my own story with you. I can testify personally that God's peace is real, and I can experience it most of the time. Um, Not because I'm a pastor, but because I know who my God is. And when troubles come to my family, you know, I may sometimes look a bit stoic, uh, as if I'm not bothered at all sometimes, if you know me, that is. Uh, But that's generally because I know who my God is. It's about having the right thinking of God. The lack of peace is not just an emotional issue. It's not just a mental issue. It's a theological issue. It's a spiritual issue. What do you know about God? See, when I read the scriptures, I know my God is sovereign. I know my God is good. I know my God will work out all things for good to those who love him. And I know my God will return one day. And I know ultimately my home is not in this world, but in heaven where I will truly be at peace before the God of peace. And I know in my own testimony, in my own life, Christian life, God has done so much things, so many things in my, in my past God has been there in this situation, and in that situation, he provided for my needs and my family's needs. Why will, not, why will God not also do the same in the, in the present and even in the future? And ultimately, I know my God is the author and giver of peace to those who have a personal relationship with him through faith in Christ. See, authentic peace cannot be achieved or attained or experienced in isolation from God. It must be received by faith in Jesus, and it must be appropriated daily in our walk with him by trusting in him. And so to conclude, God made a promise for those who in, in the future who would enter into his kingdom through Christ. And God said this in Isaiah chapter six, 26, verses 1 to 4. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city, He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind, notice, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we acknowledge and we struggle to really experience this peace because our world is so broken. It's fractured in many ways. All those pieces have fallen. And yet you came into the world, Jesus, to offer us this heavenly peace, something that even the world cannot understand. 
and we, but we as believers, we know that we can experience your peace. And it's hard, and it requires faith. And we know we, in our own sinful nature, in our own flesh, we fall into sin. And we fail to trust you. We fail to obey you. And for that, we ask for your forgiveness. And we confess them before you, knowing, believing that, God, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. So God, please, even through this message, cleanse us, refresh us, renew us, and that we will keep your word with our whole heart. Oh God, I pray that we will have a right understanding of who you are and that we, and that we, and that, and that we believe in what you have said. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Oh Lord, please, may we extend our hands to receive this peace from you. But most importantly, if there are those who don't know Christ Jesus as, as Lord and Savior, if they have not turned from their sins, if they have not placed their trust, genuinely trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if they're not genuinely walking with you, Lord, may they turn to you and to receive that peace. Because the most important peace they need is peace with you, God. They need to be restored into a, perf- into a relationship with you. They need to be reconciled to you, O oh God, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They need peace with you before they can experience the peace of you. And even now, as we enter into the time of celebrating the Lord's Supper, communion, we remember what Christ has done, and that Jesus did not just come into the world as a babe, but he came and he grew up in this life, in this world. He lived a perfect life. He obeyed all of God's commandments. He obeyed the law. He fulfilled them on our behalf when we have failed to do so. And he has done so, and he has come to restore peace so that those who trust in him can have peace, truly have peace. Oh Lord, please remind us as we celebrate this communion and help us never to take his death for granted, but all the more let us be grateful and, to, and also to experience this peace and to live out this peace. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen.